the text, well, we did, or we did the text. I did it in two different moments. And uh, it had to do, I mean, the text is about mask and the use of mask. And it's a theme that I've been interested in since the beginning of my career, like really since the early 90s. Uh, it relates very much to the idea of um, the beginning of internet, of using internet and websites and speculating about what can it be a, an avatar, what is personality, what is identity like in the digital world. And it's not the main subject, but it's a subject that has been there through all these years. So through all these years, I mean, I started making performance, I did this project with the arrestor that became a double of myself. Uh, I created this identity called Amorales, which is also the, the name I use. Uh, so to working with that, the, the, let's say the, the idea of the mask or, or the power of the mask or the meaning of the mask, it became more and more important and it's been kind of a subject. Not always in a very evident form. Uh, also, I started doing performance, and as a performer, I started to be myself the performers in a very classic way, almost like, let's say, how Vito Acocci did it, or Bruce Nauman, you know, influenced by this kind of, you know, putting a camera and filming yourself. Uh, but then, it's something that is been evolving, and maybe uh, turning into other ways of masking, not so, evident or not so clear as wearing a mask. But at the end of 1918, around that time, I started to feel uh, I want to go back to performance, in a sense, and being myself in the performance, so not, not directing or not conceptualizing and having other people, but be the person, let's say, in front of the camera. And I thought it would be interesting also to go back to this classic dispositive of putting the camera in a tripod and doing something in front of a camera. Which is also a, something that I like a lot because it, it, it is connected to slapstick. So it's something connected to the beginning of cinema, to the first experimentations of people like Buster Keaton or Frederick Burkle or Charlie Chaplin. You know, it's very basic. Just to put a camera in a tripod and you bend something and, and you play with it and doing, yeah, you deal something. Uh, and then I was writing for a catalog and it just came this text in my head. Somewhere, all these years of working with masks or thinking about the mask or trying to understand why it's a mask kind of made sense. And I became a text I call the rhetoric of the mask. So it's about mask as a language. And then came the pandemic and you all know, and we were all stuck and not knowing what to do. And I was alone in my studio, and basically I could just go there by myself. And I started to put the, the tripod and the, the camera, and then I connected the camera to the computer, and I thought, okay, this is the way to, to get the, you know, what I filmed in the computer. But you, we, we also had Zoom, it became this new phenomenon, and I thought, well, why don't I film myself through the Zoom? Because Zoom has a strange effect when you're talking with somebody, you look at yourself and it looks like looking at the mirror and at the same time you're looking at somebody else and but you are too hyper-conscious. And then I, by chance, play with it or not even, I think by mistake, I press something and the color black, it kind of became transparent, it disappeared. So when I filmed something and there was black in the screen, it became like a transparency. And I noticed that was one kind of effect that is, I think people use it to erase what is behind you or something like that. So people don't see your, your, your room. And I start to play with that. <clears throat> and I start to feel myself. And I start to first, uh, like I put music and dance, or I just start to, to film and film and film. I was really like playing in front of the mirror. But in a moment, I thought, okay, I also, I was wearing masks. And the, the reason why I wore masks is because I found these masks in the, in the market, which were very like stereotypical masks, like very stereotypical faces, but, but were a bit small. But when I put them on my face, my beard came out. 
around. So I look a bit like a werewolf, and I was like, wow, this is it's very strange. Like, I like this image. So I started to play with that. Not really creating a character with different characters and painting masks and destroying masks and playing with the masks, and then filming myself. Till I realized I, had, I could connect the text, the rhetoric of the mask with what I was filming. And then suddenly things started to make sense and it became, um, it's like a 25 minute long uh, video. Uh, I wear it with thunders. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I want to project it to you, and then we can talk about things, so we can discuss. Thank you very much. The Rhetoric of the Mask In the universe of the mask, mask language can be used to represent a mask in this way. I closing braces. This is the primary symbol representing the mask. When the internet was introduced to society, the sign that was used to symbolize it was this, at. In an email address, it stands between our name and the institution that we belong to. A mask can be used in theater, this is the traditional setting for the mask in Western culture. The Greeks established that both the individual and the group could be masked. This means the representation of the opposition between the individual and the group, just as it happens in society. A mask has two sides. An interior side that faces towards the face of the person that is wearing it. And an exterior side that faces towards the person or persons, the others, who are looking at it. The interior side faces the self. The exterior side faces the other. The mask stands in between like a membrane. It is an artifact that hides itself from the gaze of the other, rejecting the image of a fantastical character, a mythological figure, superhero, a blank face or even the face of another real person. In these cases, the mask represents another being, but the mask can also be the idealized representation of the self or an exterior vision of how one is seen by the other. To make a mask of the self and give it to others is a way to distance ourselves from itself, so one can see oneself interacting in a situation with others. As well, to make a mask of oneself is an act of branding the self. The public persona of a pop star or a politician is a mask of branding. It is the face that appears in the media, which hides its face behind the mask. Public personas are masks that become multiplied by the media. Public persona masks are needed by private persons for occupying the social space of the Internet. Occupying the space of social media in the Internet has become the ultimate space of self-colonization. Public persona occupy such space by letting their mask be multiplied by the media. Private persons make a mask of their own, which allows them to be hypocritical.
Hypocrisy is a consequence of colonization. Colonization produces hypocritical subjects, at least in the cases where people have been vanquished. Hypocrisy is a form of mask. It means yes on the outside, but at the same time no on the inside. Both the colonizer and the colonized can be hypocrites. Text can become a mask, as when a story that apparently means one thing actually means something else. This is the language of the colonies. We know it. This is also the language of social media. We have colonized social media space with a mask of ourselves. This mask is called an avatar. An avatar is a representation of the self that allows to project ourselves into the virtual space. Some people invent fictional avatars as a way to represent themselves in social media space. But most people just make avatars with their own names and portraits, as masks of their own face. It is socially understood that a genuine, trustworthy avatar must be closer in terms of representation to the real person. In many cases, we don't know what the real person is like. The more hypocritical the avatar, the more others trust in it. We just trust that they are trustworthy, but we know we are not. A mask can be used by a superhero. Superheroes are fantasy personas with special and specific extraordinary powers that characterize them in archetypical ways. Superheroes have a schematic basic psychologies through which they are rendered as simplistic personalities. Sometimes this psychological simplicity can be emphasized by a mask depicting the character's power in a graphic way. The image of the superhero is necessary for someone who has been thoroughly dehumanized, for overcoming powerlessness. The superhero image is the product of resilience. In some cases, political activists have appropriated and impersonated the image of the superhero. Social media relationships are a game of mask, although most people are unaware of it. Social media is inhabited by us and by the multitude. A multitude is a group, a mob, the mass. The individual is hypocritical, but the mass is honest. The mass is righteous. The mass has become the inquisitor in a world of hypocrites. Online masks are configurations of pixels that form portrait images. Some people are so similar to their avatars that in real life they are physical impersonators of the masks that they have produced online. Others deceive us in real life because they are unlike their mask. There is also the kind of people who are not aware that a mask can be produced online. So in real life, they are just as ordinary as their avatars are. People build the story of their avatars in a timeline. This story is what makes them appear genuine. But since we are all yes slash no masked, on social media we are stories in a timeline. The mask stands between the online life of the avatar and the real life of the person. 
people no longer distinguish the difference between the two existential areas. The border has become blurred, but the mask still stands there. The mask becomes evident when we are deceived by internet content, such as when we become aware that certain information is fictional, or that we have been approached by a fake identity. We become aware that we are being manipulated when we realize that the content that is offered to us in our timeline is close to our desires. We realize that someone or something has put our desires in front of our mask. We call this artificial intelligence a system operated by algorithms that by gathering and analyzing the data trials that we leave behind us, predicts our desires in timelines and socially controls us. Artificial intelligence controls the apparently chaotic online world. It is the puppeteer that knows how to move the puppet strings. The strings are the algorithms. The dream is that the puppeteer is not a person, but a robotic mind that orders society by a yes slash no logic. The system is situated in the liminal space of the mask, interconnecting all masks organizing them into social cells according to ideological affinity. To predict people's desires and frustrations is to predict the political future. Social cells are described as echo chambers. They appear to be independent and disconnected from the other chambers, but in fact together they form one large body. If politics is how power is divided in the land and how the wealth is distributed, today politics are the algorithm. The algorithms divides power in the country and distributes wealth. The algorithm controls a society made of masks. The politician is nothing more than a PR figure who manages the interests that move algorithms. This was recently written in the Washington Post. In general, successful political movements used to have only one ideology. Now, sometimes, they combine several. Think of the process of a music label that wants to create a new pop band. Do a market study, choose the type of faces that hit you, and then present the band to the demographic that is most favorable. The new political parties are like this. Now you can group different topics, repack them, and then market them using the same type or target message that are known to have worked in other places. If true politics are activated by the algorithm, then the ideological plane is only a rhetorical mask. People still think ideologically, but ideologies expired some decades ago. People use their timelines to express their ideological affinities, and these preferences are gathered as data to be ordered, managed, and manipulated by algorithms. At the same time, the preferences of people are induced by algorithms. And this is not only a reactive system, but one that is proacting. It shapes true politics. Seen this way, political ideologies are a form of mask. This mask is like a kaleidoscope, 
a mixture of different ideologies. True politics are algorithm politics. This kaleidoscopic mixture of political ideologies is called ideological cubism. Ideological cubism is a mask for making us believe that we have free choice, despite true politics being made produced algorithms. Ideological cubism seems incongruous, but soon it will become normalized as a standardized sham ideology, which rhetorically would make us believe that we live in a democracy. Ideological cubism leads to sham democracy. Sham democracy is the mass that hides algorithm politics. Algorithm politics feeds from sham democracy. It is a mass that feeds the soul of the machine. Ideological cubism, being a form of sham democracy, is the mass that hides algorithm politics. Sham democracy provides the information that algorithm politics needs to subsist. We are being colonized by algorithm politics, but we believe in sham democracy. To live in a sham democracy that hides algorithm politics means to exist in a world that is ruled by digital means. Algorithm politics are a system designed for mass control. Controlling the masses becomes necessary when someone fears the masses. It is the elite who fears the masses, but since the elite is made up of people, who are the elite? The members of the lead lead a solipsistic existence. The self is paramount. Sometimes the elitist self thinks that it's being manipulated by the algorithm, but in fact it is he using it to control the masses. Because natural catastrophes cause everyone to become part of the mass, the elitist self belongs to the elite until such a catastrophe occurs. Fearing the consequences of climate change exposes the elitist anxiety of being swallowed by the mass against their will. Natural catastrophes must be avoided at any price. To do so is an act elitist self-affirmation. Thus, climate change denial is part of the populist rhetoric. There are elites of vagabonds, of homeless, of crooks, of criminals, of outlaws, of anarchists, of artists and of poets. There are elites in every level of society, in families, in schools, at work. There is also the elite of rich people who own the algorithm. We are all lead solipsistic existences until we fuse our true self with the avatar. The self is elitist and the avatar is part of the mass. Someone showing an open face can use written and spoken language as a mask. This is a tactic for deception. The use of deception to mask one's true intentions is perhaps the most dangerous sort of masking. Because the act of masking is hidden in an open face. Some people use deception as their main tactic for acquiring control over the life of others. The victim might not realize that there is a mask until it is too late. The mask of the victim is perhaps the most complex mask of all. 
as it is the one that twists language in the most confusing way. Someone can wear the mask of the victim to become a victimizer. The mask rhetoric of the victim and the victimizer is a powerful motive for affecting society. We might feel ourselves to be victims of the elite or victims of the masses. We might also feel that we are the victimizers of the elite or the victimizers of the masses. In the post-colonial world that we're living in, we transit from being victims to being victimizers. The victim slash victimizer mask is ambivalent because it awakens powerful feelings of having been subjected to historical injustice. Still, post-colonial rhetoric masks the evolving process of colonization by artificial intelligence and the lead. To become colonized by artificial intelligence can be defined as neo-colonialism. As the victim slash victimizer mask has become ubiquitous, this ambivalent mask is used as much in the real world as in the online world or in the mingling of the two. It is a mask that changes its expression according to the perspective from where it's viewed. An ambivalent mask enables the communication of ambivalent messages that can be understood by conflicting parties, each one understanding it conveniently according to its own claims. For instance, the same negative message might be understood as positive by neo-colonizer and neo-colonized alike. The mask of drama and comedy allow for the theatrical representation of society. Representation is art, therefore theater is the rhetoric of the mask, either as drama or as comedy. Human life under the regime of artificial intelligence is the theatrical representation of the narrative of colonization. Both the drama of colonization and the comedy of colonization must be represented. The concept of the comedy of colonization becomes prominent when it allows us to laugh about others and ourselves. It allows to laugh as we gradually become aware that we have been colonized by superintelligent thinking machines. The laughing mask of the comedy of colonization permits a distanced relationship to the conflict colonization entails. It represents the appropriations of the appearance of power by the powerless, as a ritual that ridiculizes the colonizer's seriousness. It is the servant precariously disguised as the master, grotesquely miming its rituals of power.
Religious liturgy can be represented in art, as I is God and God is artificial intelligence. The artistic representation depicts the different stages of the religious liturgy, narrating the mythology of the self under the rule of the artificial intelligence regime. The real elite, God and artificial intelligence, are the dream of something bigger than us on this burning planet. Art is nothing but a monumental fantasy, the one in which humanity rules the world with robots, and robots rule over us. In this dream, the real elite board their spaceships and head towards space. In the ecological mess that they leave behind, the proxy elite fuses with the mass of commoners in a narcissistic orgy. Fuck you! goes the rocket, transporting the rich to their salvation. <laughs> I always feel a bit weird after showing this. <laughs> Super dense. Uh, but I thought maybe it's nice to have a conversation together. Have more a dialogue than a lecture, more than a lecture. Boring. No, I like it like this. It is more <laughs> quiet. Um, what can I say? Did you show why you want me to show? You want me to start? If you want. Hay otro? No, 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 into this kind of, um, um, yeah, I guess, analysis or, or kind of um, thoughts around the world we live. I mean, um, you know, we both started when internet did not even exist. And, uh, and the world has been changing very, very, very fast. You know, it's almost as if the, the <clears throat> the context is moving so fast that it's very hard to keep up. And in a way, the pandemic became a, a moment where <clears throat> it kind of forced us to slow down and, to, and, and it was a perfect moment to reflect uh, you know, on, on, on this um, very, very strange environment that we live in and, and very hard to decipher um, uh, where, where you know, there's kind of um, masks uh, all around us. So 
I, I was just wondering if maybe that can be like a good place to to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I did my master in Holland in '96, and the first day we were presented to you know to a school kind of city like now. <clears throat> Came a guy and projected something into the screen and said it was a website. I was like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> I was understood. And he said, like, ah, and the great thing is that we're going to give you an email. But he made one email for the whole academy. So we all had the same email, like, since they did not get the same email. And he printed them and he put them in the, I said, it was on, like, in the mailbox. <clears throat> and I happened to have this German teacher, Manfred Stumpf, uh, who I think he used to study for Joseph Boy. Uh, he was very obsessed with uh, Middle Ages uh, iconography. I think, I don't know if he was from Munster or Stuttgart, but he was very involved in this kind of, yeah, you know, representation of dragons and knights, and, but, and also in the religious way, you know. He was a funny guy, he had shaved his, uh, you know, like a monk, la tonsura in Spanish, but, <coughs> And he said something to be very interesting. He said that, he said, at the beginning there will only be superheroes. Basically saying that superheroes are very basic, kind of stereotypical depictions of personality, you know, of identity. And that in the beginning this will be very simple to recognize and it will be very, like, let's say, we will work with big pixels. <clears throat> but as this will evolve, it will become more and more sophisticated and more personal. Let's say it won't be any more about fiction being um, easy to recognize, you know, like in old films, but it will be really mingling with reality. So you, it will be sophisticated so much that it will become almost personal. And she told me about the idea of uh, interface, uh, about how you represent things in the computer, like for instance, the trash can or. You know, this iconography, that's where I also understand his interest in iconography. And to me, I start, you know, like being an artist from Mexico, I was 26 then, kind of trying to enter into the European world. Uh, I had a big conflict of what is to be Mexican there, or how I'm profiled as a Mexican, or what I'm supposed to do as a Mexican artist what I want to do, what is my desire, what I want to learn. <clears throat> uh, so the mask became like a very good uh, tool, I would say. Not so much an image, not so much something that represents, but something that you can use to work with. So like more the brush or the canvas, let's say, than the image itself, you know? So it became a tool. And that's how I started kind of thinking about it, no? or how <clears throat> I tried to draw a parallel between what I thought would be the art world, because I mean I was 26, so I had to imagine what was that, or what I could understand. <clears throat> but I thought, okay, let's make a parallel between the wrestling world and the art world. Let's, let's put them together as, as parallel worlds. <clears throat> Where for instance, the wrestler would be the, the artist, the manager would be the galleries, the arena will be the museum, and so on, you know? And that I did for seven years, so it was quite a long. And of course, it's not connected to media directly, but it's connected in a more existential way. That's what, what I think. And that's how I learned. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I think the pandemic was a very strong, I mean, for many people it was a terrible moment, but it was for the big majority, like a very strong existential moment. It was a moment where we had time to pause, where there was no work, there were, everything was canceled, stopped or postponed. And certainly we had time and fear, a lot of fear. And we also had just Trump before, so not only fear, but a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, tension. I think we, could, we came from these four years of, you know, it was a very, I have to thought, Jesus, we're already in a very fucked up situation and it's just getting more and more and more and more fucked up. You know, it just went 
in every level. No? So as an artist, I thought going to the studio is a way to refuge. You know, like the first year I was completely paralyzed. I could do nothing. I was just afraid, watching the news, looking at the telephone. <clears throat> I could not really think of working. I could not really... I met this Purepe charity, so I, I started to think about other artists, you know, about... You know, like, I could not produce. <clears throat> but in 2001, when it started, it was, I think it was the second wave or third wave of the virus, suddenly was more attempt to refugee, to, to hide. And then I had this chance to, to start filming, to start playing. And it was also a moment we were very politicized because there was also a lot of going on with culture and the government. They were uh, diffusing, I would say, the grant system, and FONCA. So it was also a moment of a lot of discussion, but not in person, but a lot of discussion on chat groups which started to become more and more sick, and more and more difficult, so it also started to become really heavy. So this starts also in a moment where I decide to distance myself. You know? Carlos, uh, it's wonderful to see your video. I have a lot of questions. I'm going to try and smoosh as much into one as possible, but it should hopefully make sense. Um, but I, I really appreciated what you said at the very beginning about masks as a language, and then kind of in the video you talk about language as a mask. And I'm curious about the role of language in this video choosing to speak in English with the Spanish subtitles, but then also um, how perhaps, because within, within like indigenous African, many different indigenous African communities, the mask is not uh, a tool of deception or obscuring, but a tool for transformation or transmutation into something divine temporarily. And so I'm curious about the role of the mask itself, but then its language itself as a transformative tool, potentially, and how there's even the potential to transform your, like, our own relationships to the masks we present to the world, or uh, to even how we would want to utilize this mask that is ever-present. <laughs> You hear me? No. <laughs> and the text came in English, and it just you know, appeared like that. It was I wrote it in a month, and it just suddenly a lot of things make sense to me. I don't know if they make sense, but it just came to me like that. And Spanish is more baroque. And it's more you know when you write in Spanish, you start, I start to think more about style. I start to be more worried that it's well written. You know, like, and in English, somehow, the ideas come very fast. And, you know, the internet is also not, I mean, it's, a language, it's in many languages, but I also think a lot is in English. Or it has become a lingua franca kind of, kind of thing. I mean, the original text, not the text here, because this is a selection of moments. Uh, it had the idea to create like a language of emoticons, of emojis. So the idea is that every one of these concepts, you know, like the mask or, I don't know, there are different concepts appear, like the mask of deception, the mask of the victim, the mask, the Janus mask, you know, which one is represented as a symbol, as a emotical symbol. So you can write in that language. And it actually was made like that. So it's, it's a typeface where every type, every font, or no, every letter, um, it represents one of these uh, emojis that represent <coughs> this. And it doesn't, it, you cannot use it, but it's, it's a bit like, like the concept of having like a language that will be made of math. So beyond English or Spanish. Uh, it's 
not just translated into Spanish, like the, the text, the subtitles are in the film. So it's not like I put them on the film, but they're part of the film. And to me, writing in the film is very important. Maybe it's also because in Mexico we see a lot of subtitles when we see films. Uh, but actually, like now I was reading it, basically. You know, like you can read it or you can hear it, but it, it can be both. You know, it's, it's, it's the text in the film. Uh, it's not just there to translate. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's not about mask, it's not an encyclopedia of mask. I think it's mask about how I perceive reality nowadays, no? Or in that moment. Because also I think things have evolved and also things have changed. Uh, but, so yeah, I mean, there is, for instance, a, a <clears throat> there are many references or little reference to, uh, to art history or to film history. There is a reference, for instance, uh, for this film, Le Magicien de la Terre. Uh, the, no, Le Magicien Fou, uh, The Crazy Masters, which is by uh, is this French, uh, Jean Rouge. And it's about the Hauka movement and how the Hauka movement in Africa was appropriating the rituals of the colonizers and then they were making fun of it in a way, you know, in rituals. I don't know if you know this film. It's very interesting because it's really, <clears throat> it creates like a very strong shock uh, because it's, it's like a very pessimistic way to rebel against colonialism in a way that you are uh, bankish, you know? Like, it's like the opposite of a revolution. You know? and, and for instance, there, there are these very interesting moments for, for me, or, or messages that I'm putting them. Um, I mean, also in Mexico, there is a tradition of mask, no? and it's very much there. And I tried not to reflect on that so much. Yet. I think I wanted to use it in a more urban way, or in a more, uh, as my reality. More in relation to internet, more in relation to this uh, identities we're constantly building, you know, like with, with our social media. You know, I think we all do it. You know, nobody is honest in a way. I mean, we all have to represent. And if you are honest, then you are in tr trouble. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I see that your work has uh, developed from uh, from from the performance art, and you have a very strong relationship with the art history in terms even of the Greek. Do you go back to the theater or the the mask, the way that the Greek used the mask? Uh, it's a very political, strong statement, and the question is. How do you consider your work in terms of the political, um, as a political activist? Or do you more, go more with the terms of aesthetics? Yeah. Aesthetics or more political? How do you consider your work? <laughs> if it's political or? Uh, it's a balance. It's a It's like a very difficult question. Um, because I am very dissatisfied with political art, but it's just very political. Because of it, there are too many ways sometimes to, to become almost too obvious. You know, it's just about commenting. Um, and also, I think <clears throat> there is like a like a problem of origin in art because we we create illusion and in another way we try to touch about reality so that it becomes a very confusing it's maybe the paradox of art you know, we are not scientists kind of writing about reality and trying to put this in a way we we are 
were creating artificial love, no? And then, of course, there is the way you personally re react or relate to your own aesthetic. And that's personal, and that's something we do it, and it's beyond your control. Some people are very keen, and some people are very dirty, or some people are very colorful, or other black and white, whatever. <clears throat> but also aesthetics have something about seduction, which are very interesting, I think. So you can also use aesthetics in a certain way. So you can build, you know, like, and you can seduce, you can hypnotize through aesthetics. And then also, that can become political, you know, that you, you can... Uh, I mean, I'm not interested in forming itself as a formalist artist, but I'm interested more in systems and how things work, and, and, and I try to play with that. I mean, this is a very uncommon work for me, because I'm trying to give statements, I'm trying to say something about reality. <clears throat> Normally I don't work like that. Uh, Maybe it's an achievement for myself in the sense of, okay, I'm trying to say something about how I perceive the world instead of being ambiguous or, or you know, playing in other kind of levels, you know, or more subtle. It's, it's my voice, I'm telling you. It's my, in my English, you know, it's like, the, the, I'm like, I am the person, I am the person talking. I am. <clears throat> so, of course, I have to find different ways of um, dealing with that, you know, make it tolerable, you know, like make it tolerable to myself. Uh, like appear without a mask in front of her, appear with a mask, but without, with, not like a... Mm, so both, I would say. <clears throat> and in that sense, I'm more interested in anarchy, you know, I'm not... But I'm also, I wouldn't say I'm an anarchist, I don't live like an anarchist, or perhaps, I don't know, but I have a passport, you know, like, <laughs> <coughs> so, but I like to read about anarchy, or in my fantasy, I, I agree more with that, and it's not only the, it's anarchy in general, you know, it's not only, I'm not only thinking about the left-wing anarchy, but the right-wing anarchy, it's like, it's super interesting, because also it's supposed to not to be right-wing nor left. It should also be something else. So, so I think, what is this something else? What is this other position? I find it interesting. I also find it healthy, because we are very <clears throat> right or left. You know, like it's very constantly we're in this kind of fight. So I think it's interesting to find other, other points of view, other positions. So I'm very apolitical, very political. <laughs> See? Um, so I had about three questions, but they're kind of short. Just one is, you said that you were returning to performance. I just wanted to know how you felt. Like, what was that experience like for you to kind of go back to performing? Um, also, whether you had kind of nicknames or characters, because I feel like you perform different personalities, or I just don't know how you envision them, or how you think about them, like well, the hoodie, and, or they just felt like different performers. And also, how do you think about the, I hesitate to call it music, maybe soundscape for the piece? Uh, <clears throat> okay. first. Uh, performing again. And performance is, is, I think, the most difficult. <clears throat> Every time I do a performance, just before I'm going to go out, I feel there. I'm like, why did I put myself in this situation? <laughs> something very terrible about performance. Also because we're not trained really, you know? And true performers are really, like I saw Joan Jonas, for instance, and she's really a performer. And to, you know, after years and years of doing it, to see the knowledge, how she's doing it, the presence. <clears throat> but in a way, we're not dancers, we're not actors. We're, so it is, it has this strange position that is a, it's interesting because it's vulnerable, but it can also be terrible. It's, it's like a straight. So that's also why you wear a mask or why you wear a nickname. That's how I call myself a Morales because it became 
interesting to use this nickname, so I could do a lot of things. If I was Aguirre Morales, which is my real name, I, it would be like, you know, like, <laughs> the, I'm the real person. It becomes more naked, you know what I'm So I think you create kind of, um, yeah, levels of protection. Because I also think it's, it's very much about the self and the audience. You know? that's, that's our job as artists, like we and the audience, and the relation to that. You know? In any way, not always, there are different ways. It's different to put a painting and go, that is different to put a video and be there, or it's diff different to act, you know, like... But at the end, it's between the audience, it's a ping pong between the audience and us, you know? I think that's the main thing. And the music is it's made by Guillermo este, Galindo. He's a musician. It's a soundscape with his music, and it's very intense. Uh, we collaborated in something else, in, in Bienal FEMSA, which is a Bienal that is made in Mexico, in different uh, states. And actually, it was made for another piece, but I was trying, I, tr I tried it in this piece, and I was like, wow, it works super well. And I, uh, I asked him if he would be agreeing that I take his sound as, as, as for it. I cannot say a lot about it, but it's, it's very interesting for me. It creates, I don't know, I, I like it very much. I work a lot with music, so I, I... You know, it's not only about the words, but it's also not only about the images, but it's what comes together, you know, and, and I think... I'm very happy how this worked. Um, he was in a very troubled moment. We also met him in Chocan, and <clears throat> he was very confused and also pandemic. And, all. and he just played like in two hours. He did it. And I was like, wow, you know, like this really true uh, com composer. You know? I was like, wow. <clears throat> Sometimes it's like that with music. Hi, thank you. Um, I wonder why you didn't use more of the aspect of the mask as a protection, as you said, with performing. Um, and my question is, why you didn't use the mask as protection in a year that we were using face mask? And like the mask is also a protection from bad energies. In I just wonder why you didn't use that positive positive aspect of the mask. Uh, because I, when the pandemic started, uh, the government in Mexico was kind of denying mask. And I started to get very nervous and anxious about it. I thought it was really stupid. And I thought, yeah, we have to use masks. And also in Mexico, we have a lot of people working in the street anyways, because you know they have uh, irregular jobs, you know? So like a lot of people died. For instance, the garbage people or the market people, or there was like this. <clears throat> so I thought I should make masks for all <laughs> these people. And I organized a system, and I thought, okay, if I get money from collectors, and you know, you know, like, so I start to produce a mask, like face mask, not real mask, but like face mask. And it was interesting because suddenly all this work started to happen. I was I never came out of my house, but all this started to happen. I started to produce these thousands of masks and distribute them and bring them. And the people who got them, they, they just made a, like, like a little selfie or a photo and sent it to these people from the association I was collaborating with. And, uh, and then I got thousands of pictures of people with a red mask and it became really like, whoa. <clears throat> and so people started to question if this is art or not. I didn't care. I just thought it was necessary. Maybe in my own discourse, so it was very strong to see a crowd mask. Uh, so you see that everybody's wearing a mask. And of course, the more suddenly it was like, everybody started to wear masks, it became irrelevant. 
and then you still see people wearing masks. I don't know if you noticed, but sometimes you see people in the metro, and I wonder, no? But there was this moment where all, everybody in Mexico was with a mask. So then my mask disappeared in the mask. You know, it just was irrelevant. So going to my studio allowed me to exactly not wear that, you know, to be, and also I was alone, you know, so I could, I could infect myself. <laughs> I feel like I had a problem, you know. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I think it's that. And there are moments in the film which are a bit weird for me, where I try to be without a mask, and I appear without a mask. And, and it's the first time I do it, really, in my work because all the work I did with masks before was about masking myself, was about not being myself there, was about kind of <coughs> suppressing the ego, you know, and then, for instance, giving the mask to another, you know? so trying to make art not through my ego, it was paradoxical, of course, because I call the mask a morales, you know, it's super self-referential, but it was trying to, because, for instance, I saw all this work by artists from the previous generation, they were using themselves, so they became really like characters, you know, like Peter Conchi, Rose Nauman. You know, they, they become iconic, and, and it, it was about... <clears throat> and when I saw, for instance, Matthew Barney in the 90s, I was like, wow, what is this? You know, it's completely changing that role. Suddenly, this guy completely dressed like some kind of goat, you know, like, <coughs> what is happening? Why, why is fantasy coming here, you know? But in that moment, it was very attractive. And the other aspect, I don't know, I, I, I mean, the, the, the piece is quite like heavy, no? It's, it's, it's not a very nice view of society, it's like a bit like, uh, <clears throat> I feel there is a moment of hope at the end, and that's why I show the, the pregnant woman, it's, it's, that is hope for me, it's like a child who's reborn and can be so, can go somewhere else. And actually, I was waiting for this chance, so. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, and then, you know, it's, it's fuck you, you know, like it's, it's the rich escaping the planet, you know, and, and everybody stays here, like, oh fuck, <laughs> like, what is this, no? And, and when I left Mexico in, in the early 90s, I had a, by chance, pure chance, I had the chance to live in London <coughs> in, a, in a commune that actually was connected to a project called Biosphere 2. And that project basically they were trying to build in Arizona, like a glass house, where there would be these five main ecosystems where a group of scientists might try to live there for a year. And if they would manage, it meant that we could build houses in the moon or we could build Mars, you know. So actually these, these ideas are there, you know. It's not just a fantasy, like it's not just paranoid. Like, there's people trying that, you know. So, so yeah, I thought, okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you think you are or you are wearing a mask right now. <laughs> I have this suit. I put this suit for you. Um, normally I was <laughs> And I was with jeans and I went home and I got the rain and I was like cold. And in the moment coming here, I thought, ah, I should put myself on its own. So it's a mask in a sense. Um, of course, when you speak in public, you try, you have to develop a mask. You know, it's part of it. It's no, you wish it was not there, but you have to. You know, like it's kind of there, I think, in a way. <clears throat>
Thank you very much.